Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And today we have Martha Tettenborn. Our title for today is Hacking Chemo, A Dietitian's Journey to Beating Cancer Using Nutritional Interventions. So Martha, welcome. Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate being here. Um, so I'm a, a dietitian, as you said. I've been a dietitian for 35 odd years. Um, and so I trained as a dietitian back in the sort of the early 80s when low fat cholesterol sort of stuff was king of everything. It was the newest cutting age research. Um, so I have practiced as a dietitian for um, all of my career um, in Ontario. I'm Canadian and uh, I've worked in hospital and I've worked in home care and I've had a private practice and I settled into long-term care um, probably about 20 years ago. And so I am a consultant dietitian working for um, long-term care facilities at this time. And I also have a private practice um, doing low carb nutrition as well. Um, about two years ago, I um, was feeling absolutely fabulous. Like at 58, I had no health issues whatsoever. I was pretty smug about being that healthy, actually. And I suddenly discovered that I had um, a large lump in my abdomen. I actually lay down on the floor one day and on my belly to do an exercise, a, a plank, and discovered that I had this hard lump in my abdomen and it turned out to be um, quite a large ovarian cyst um, I had it ultrasounded and it was just a big fluid filled cyst so nobody suspected anything um, I started down the referral path to a gynecologist and planned for surgery and so on but it's summer in Canada which means that you know everybody's on holidays everything took a little time and it was about two months before between the time I was diagnosed and when I actually had um, the cyst removed. And I had it removed through a little laparoscopic incision. Uh, so they deflated this great big balloon. They took a liter and a half of fluid out of this cyst. So that's about a quart and a half um, of liquid. So it was really big. It was like being about five months pregnant by the time it finally came out. And um, that was fine. Every, you know, that was the plan. And then about six days later, they called me and um, said, you need to come back in and see the surgeon. Come tomorrow, bring your husband. Um, and of course, I immediately knew what that meant because I work in healthcare, So I got it. And uh, they told me that I had stage one um, ovarian cancer. And that I need, because they had ruptured the cyst in removing it, which of course was, say, the plan, we all agreed on that, um, that I needed to undergo further cancer treatment. So I was sent off to a referral center, which is about three hours from where I live. I'm pretty rural here in Ontario. And um, met with a um, gynecological oncologist who highly recommended that I do chemotherapy. Um, because of the rupture that took place and the potential for a spill of cancer cells into my abdomen. So that's, oh, and he also recommended that I have a full hysterectomy and, you know, kind of complete the surgical standard of care for ovarian cancer. So I had a second surgery and, um, and then about five weeks later, I started chemotherapy um, for um, six rounds of treatment. Paclitaxel and carboplatin, which are the two sort of standard drugs for ovarian cancer. And uh, yeah, that took me through the winter of 2019 um, through till about the middle of summer. So uh, that was when I was prior to that time, that couple of months in the fall of 2018, when I discovered I had cancer and I had some time to do some research that I started looking into what um, I could possibly do to impact on my path in terms of this cancer treatment. Um, I'm incredibly drug naive. I don't even take a Tylenol more than a couple of times a year. And so I was frankly terrified of putting this poisonous chemotherapy into my body. Um, and that was sort of where I headed down the, the path of research online research and discovered um, something that I had no idea existed, which was the entire field of cancer metabolism. 
I did not know that there was um, a, a different metabolism in cancer cells, a different use of fuel. And of course, nutrition is all about fuel, right? So there's a role for nutrition in cancer treatment when you are dealing with cancer metabolism. Um, and that's kind of what headed me down that rabbit hole. So the, uh, the book and everything is what came out of that. <laughs> So let's talk about how you combined intermittent fasting and fasting as well into your journey. Sure. So we should probably back up to sort of what cancer metabolism is and why it's different. And then fasting makes sense. Okay, perfect. Um, so in normal healthy cells, we are, we are born with the ability to, to burn a variety of fuels. We can burn um, sugar which we call blood glucose. We can burn fatty acids, which are uh, the breakdowns of fats that we either consume in our diet or that we store on our bodies. Um, and we can uh, burn a fuel called ketones, which is a water-soluble fuel that's made from fatty acids in your liver. So that, those, those different metabolic pathways all exist in a normal healthy person, except that in our, our current North American dietary pattern, we tend to eat so many carbohydrates that we simply haven't got the other machinery even in place inside our cells to burn fatty acids or ketones because we eat carbohydrates every couple of hours and we tend to eat a lot of them in our normal standard American diet. So, um, in cancer cells, it turns out, the machinery, the, the little mitochondria, which is the organelle inside each cell that processes fuel, is damaged in cancer cells. And they don't have the ability to burn fatty acids, and they don't have the ability to burn ketones. They only burn sugar. And they don't do it in the way that healthy cells do. They do it by a different metabolic pathway actually it's not even a metabolic pathway it's a chemical reaction called fermentation and it happens in the fluid of the cell so it's a very quick um, energy source so it's basically just a chemical switch a breakdown of the sugar in the cells and boom you have few you have energy produced but you also have lactic acid produced which is acidic which is damaging to a cell so then the cancer has to deal with that um, one of the hallmarks of cancer is that it has no ability to downregulate or slow itself down. It is always looking for fuel. It's always trying to grow. That's very different from healthy cells, which can turn themselves into kind of a, a slow down state when fuel is scarce. And that's how we have always survived as a species. It's how all life survives. We downregulate when we don't have fuel and we upregulate when we do have fuel. Cancer can't do that. It just, it's on all the time. And it's, and so it's hungry for sugar all the time. So given that, that metabolism, which it's interesting that, that, that the research that initially determined that was done a hundred years ago. And in fact, a scientist in 1931 won the Nobel Prize for delineating this, this disordered metabolism that cancer has. He called it the Warburg effect. He named it after himself. Um, and so we knew about it, but then it was lost. It, the, the genetic aspect of DNA and what it looked like was determined um, in the next 20 years after that. And the entire machinery of the cancer industry sort of shifted to this idea that cancer had damaged genetics. And that's kind of where it has been ever since. So the, the whole cancer metabolism field was just kind of tossed on the dustbin. And it was really only revived in the last 15 years or so by some researchers who are doing some work around that. Um, because it's a fuel partitioning issue, that means that there are nutritional interventions that can impact on the fuel that your body has. And I was already a dietitian who was a bit of a renegade because I was outside of 
um, the norm because I practiced using a low carb paradigm. I had done some additional education and um, got a health coach certification and so on in low carb. So I was already going that direction. And um, of course, lo- a low carb diet reduces the amount of sugar in your blood, which also reduces the amount of insulin that you have circulating in your system. And insulin is a growth factor that cancer needs very badly if it's going to grow the way it wants. So when you can keep those things low in your blood, you can really stress out the cancer cells because they can't get what they need to grow. And if you really want to take it further, you drop your carbs so low that your body goes into ketosis, nutritional ketosis. And that means that you are producing in your liver, your, your fatty acids, um, your stores of fat in your body or, or your diet are supplying fatty acids and your liver uses those fatty acids to build ketones, which are little chemicals that are water soluble and they can be broken down for fuel in almost every single place that sugar is used in the body. So they're a great fuel. Um, they supply your brain, they supply your muscles, they you know keep, kind of keep everything happy. Um, so when you put your body into nutritional ketosis, you're, you're feeding your healthy cells a great fuel, fatty acids and ketones, but the cancer can't use those, those fuels. So it's stressed, it's pissed off. And um, that's why the, the ketogenic diet is great for, um, for not supporting cancer growth. Okay. Then when you go further and you actually fast, something really magical, I call it magical, it's not magical, it's chemical, um, but something wonderful happens in that your healthy cells will go into that down-regulated mode that we talked about, where they literally put themselves into just kind of a maintenance phase. They'll start doing some internal housekeeping, which we call autophagy, um, where they actually clean up some of the... Um, unused or damaged parts of themselves and use that for fuel, but they get into what I call stealth mode. The cool thing about that is that, first of all, it makes it really hard for cancer to grow. So the cancer is again stressed, but chemotherapy as a treatment is a chemical that is designed to uh, target fast metabolizing cells. So it's a blunt weapon. It doesn't say, oh, you're cancer and you're not. What it's looking for is the, the, the hallmarks or the, the chemical signals of fast metabolism. And if you can slow down your healthy cells, the cancer lit, or the chemotherapy literally doesn't find it. So you, you protect your healthy cells from the damage of chemotherapy, which reduces your side effects dramatically. and You've stressed out the cancer cells. So when you do hit them with something, because remember, cancer has no off switch. So the cancer cells are just sitting there with like red lights flashing on them. And so the chemotherapy hits them while they're already stressed. And that makes the chemotherapy even more effective than it would be otherwise. So the fasting is almost like this magical superpower. It makes the chemo work better and it protects the, the rest of you, your healthy cells. So when I went through chemotherapy, I did a lot of research on the work that was being done in this area. And my the protocol that I kind of came up with was to, um, to do a fast for a total of 72 hours. So that's three days. And that was um, about 36 hours prior to my chemotherapy treatment. Then the time of my chemo, which in my case was about 10 hours. It was a kind of a long protocol. And then for 24 hours after the chemo. And by doing that, I downregulated my healthy cell metabolism, quieted it down, um, had my chemo treatment, kept it quiet for about 24 hours after my chemo treatment, and then started eating again. And I stayed strictly ketogenic the entire time that I was in treatment. So that was about five months. Um, that I was you know, sort of hardcore in ketosis the whole time. 
Hey guys, I really want you to join our intermittent fasting and OMAD Facebook group. We're doing tons of giveaways right now for posting your before and after pictures and just for posting a question in there. We're giving away free protein shakes, some digest aid, all kinds of fun stuff. So please join our intermittent fasting and OMAD Facebook group. The link is in the show notes. That is awesome. Well, this, I mean, I guess the the big thing is, is that I know I've seen some different research that has, they've done, you know, small tri- trials on humans. They've done trials on rats that they have said that having a very low carb diet um, has massive benefits with cancer therapy and also preventing cancer. So... I mean, this is just really, really a great story. So what does kind of your everyday life look like now? So kind of give us kind of the day in the life of Martha. Okay. Well, the day in the life of Martha now is what I would call a moderate low carb um, diet. I don't tend to stay in ketosis on a everyday basis. Um, I usually don't eat breakfast. I have black coffee, a couple of cups. Um, I will take something if I'm going to work, I'll take something with me and have it maybe at 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. And then I I carry a a low carb lunch, uh, often leftovers. I'm not much of a, I don't know, usually leftovers, hard boiled eggs, something like that. Um, if I'm home and, uh, my husband's home, we'll make a big bacon and egg cheese sort of stack you know um with some fried sweet onions or something on the side and that will be kind of brunch right supper is always a low carb supper which is usually meat and some kind of vegetables um i do make fathead pizza every once in a while and and um i have some low carb pizzas that i'll use as a um as a hamburger bun shell and things like that um but For the most part, you know, we'll eat modest carbohydrates. We'll have sweet potatoes once in a while. Um, I'm not beyond having a a really amazing cookie or something if that crosses my path, but it doesn't usually. I have, I've never been much of a sweet tooth. And so that part wasn't really a problem for me to give up. And now if I try anything, even halfway normal in terms of sweets, I just find them gaggingly sweet and so I really can't do that um once or twice a week I have I might have a glass of rum in the evening just straight high high quality sipping rum that with a couple of ice cubes in it so it's zero carbohydrate um I like the flavor I I find the flavor sweet even though there's no no carbs in it um but it disturbs my sleep when I do that so I really try not to (laughs) Yeah, more of a Friday night thing, you know. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Sure. So um, when I started down the cancer path um, and realized that there was this whole field of cancer metabolism, I became absolutely passionate about sharing it. So I started a blog. And the blog is at marthatettenborn.com. So it's just my name. Um, There's recipes on there. There's, you know, my own story, um, some of the research and so on. And then I decided to write a book. So it has been quite a process over the last year, but I published my book called Hacking Chemo Using Ketogenic Diet, Therapeutic Fasting, and a Kick-Ass Attitude to Power Through Cancer. And it part my story, part the whole cancer metabolism thing, um, how to use nutritional interventions to impact on cancer, and some recipes, and then a whole section on the spiritual, mental, emotional aspect of going through cancer. There were just so many things that I learned as I went through that process. So the book is available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, Chapters in Canada, any of the um, the major platforms. It's gone wide. Um, hacking people, it's called. Awesome. Well, you guys stay tuned. We have another episode coming up in just a few. Bye bye for now.